This audio is a recording of the talk, Revolutionary Organisation in the Digital Age. This talk was given during a speaking tour of Norway in June 2014, and in it, the author Andrew Flood looks at the experience of resisting the crisis in Ireland and what it has to teach us about revolutionary politics in the new digital networked age. You'll find more audio at www.wsm.ie. Uh, so, the title of this talk is Revolutionary Organisation in the Digital Age, and because I'm in Norway, I'm going to be talking about Ireland a lot, right? Yeah. The concrete <laughs> examples I'm using are from Ireland. Um, so, if you don't know a lot about Ireland, the useful thing to know is the population is more or less the same size. So, you know, if I say there's 100,000 people on a demonstration, well, that's more or less the same as 100,000 people in Norway, except Norway being much bigger, it's yes. obviously harder to get everybody to Oslo for a demonstration or something. Um, the, uh, yeah, the Vikings I just had to put in there for a laugh. Um, uh, but on the historic level, um, also what you need to know about Ireland is that pretty much there hasn't been an anarchist movement there at all until very recently. Um, there hasn't also been much of a, a, a left um, and this photograph actually kind of tells you a bit about the Irish left, um, in that there's three things happening in it. The first thing is the, the banner is from the organisation I'm a member of, or Solidarity Movement, so that's an anarchist group that's been around since the 1980s. The building in the background is the General Post Office, which is famous because in 1916 there was an armed rebellion against British rule in the city, and that's the building they used as the headquarters. So. Um, that lasted about a week, and uh, quite a lot of central Dublin actually got destroyed in it. But that that very much then defined what radical politics was in Ireland, i.e. it was uh, armed uh, nationalist. Uh, but it could also be left-wing, and part of the reason it could be left-wing was that 1916, of course, was in the middle of the, the big syndicalist upsurge that went from about 1885 to the Russian Revolution. So all over the world there were big syndicalist organisations came, there were, there were ones in Norway as well. Um, and the statue in the middle is a guy called Jim Larkin, who was a member of the IWW in the United States, who moved back to Ireland and set up a, a, a syndicalist union in Ireland um, with the help of similar unions in Britain. Um, and in 1913, there was a year-long strike which more or less destroyed that union. But in, to defend the strike against the police, they set up a workers' militia, and that also took part in that 1916 rising. Um, and in fact, it was quite a big part. It was about 20% of the forces that turned out. About 1,700 rebels took part in the fighting. Um, so that, that basically meant that what we'd consider a revolutionary left in most European countries, in fact, has been dominated by an armed force nationalist movement with strong left-wing leanings, which is quite unusual in the European context. Normally, you tend to associate that sort of movement with the right. Um, the uh, tradition of uh, armed rebellion in Ireland against British rule is quite an old one, um, and initially, it's the sort of boring story you have everywhere where it's really a fight between kings as to who gets to rule a particular piece of land. Uh, but with the French Revolution and the American Revolution of the 1780s and the 1790s, all that changed radically and for the first time you got the idea that actually instead of selecting which king you wanted to rule you, people could rule themselves. Um, and in 1798 there was this huge rebellion, there was probably 30,000 people uh, took up arms, and arms in those days meant one of the things these guys are carrying, which is a pike. Um, you can use it to pull cavalry or horses, you can you know, try and stab other soldiers with it, um, and that was the main arm of that rebellion. Um, and part of the reason I'm putting that into the introduction, there's a context of Ireland, but also part of what I'm, I'm, I'm looking at here is the way the left is often reluctant to change its methodologies. Like, it, it does particular things because it's always done them. So something that people would be familiar with from some countries is paper sales. You know, the left, a lot of left organisations base themselves around going to the centre of town and standing there with a newspaper and trying to sell it. Um, Armed struggle is a bit different because if you stick with pikes in the 20th century, you're all going to get killed really quickly. So there are faster lessons to it. So the um, so this next image uh, is from 1981, 
And in 1981, uh, 1981, I, I just turned, I think it was 12, um, and I started to think a little bit about politics. And the big thing that influenced me that year was the hunger strikes, and that's when uh, 10 Irish Republican prisoners starved themselves to death as a protest against uh, their conditions in the prisons in Northern Ireland. So this is the funeral of the first one of them, a guy called Bobby Sands. About 100,000 people uh, turned out to the funeral. And again, it, you, it, it shows the, uh, the cutaway in the bottom corner, the kind of armed force tradition that still existed and completely dominated revolutionary politics in Ireland up to that point. Um, 1984, another thing that was massively influential on me was the miners' strike in Britain. Uh, so that's, again, it's about a year-long struggle, um, and it sees massive confrontations between the miners and the police. It was on, even in Ireland, it was on television every day, and we collected in school for the miners and the collections in the city centre. Um, but the interesting thing about this image is if you look at the, the police in it, um, they're pretty much wearing ordinary, everyday clothes. I mean, it's a uniform, but like it's, they're wearing coats, they have like, funny pointy hats. Um, and the big change that we've seen in the last 20 years in terms of policing is now British police can look like this. This is actually, this might be Birmingham um, at the time of the London riots when they were mobilising there as well. So you get all the, and this is international, you know, so you get this kind of, uh, it's almost like Robocop type gear, type gear or whatever. Um, and that's another example of the way things change, because in the 1980s, in both Ireland and in Britain, indeed, into the early 1990s, a, a popular form of militant political protest were mass riots. So, like, probably the poll tax riot in Britain is the most famous one, where up to half a million people were involved. Um, and that came to an end partially because the police started tuning up like this and it became completely uneven, but also because of um, closed-circuit television. Um, uh, which meant that in, in the 80s, if somebody was involved in something like that and they walked away at the end, they probably weren't going to get arrested. Today, people get arrested six months afterwards or a year afterwards because they've been caught on video. Um, and so part of the way that the, the sections of the left that quite like that sort of thing have reacted to that is to trying to um, out-compete uh, or, or find ways to avoid the police. So, I mean... This is as good as any image of that. So the idea is you turn up in your mast and nobody can identify you because you've got this little letterbox thing. But that's not really much use in terms of mass politics because it, it's something that people need to know what to do in order to take part in it. It's only ever a few people. Um, so part of the reason I kind of wanted to uh, start with those two examples is I think with a lot of... Like, if you, if you want to talk about paper sales, it's easy to dismiss that sort of thing because it's really boring and who wants to do that, right? Uh, but people also cling on to other forms uh, of, of activity because it's what we used to do. Rioting is kind of one of those things. In the Irish context, uh, we've had a peace process for 20, well, yeah, 20 years now, uh, but you still have a load of these tiny groups that want to return to armed struggle and every now and again, you know, set up a bomb somewhere, but they've no support. Uh, and, the, and they're not really going anywhere with it. But the, the, to them, that is what revolutionary politics is. To other people, revolutionary politics is standing in the middle of the street and selling a newspaper. Uh, and I used to do that years ago. Um, and then at a certain point in time, we went, well, you know, why are we actually doing this? Like, I didn't get involved in far-left politics because I wanted to be a, a newspaper seller. You know, I don't like sales at all. If I was <laughs> going to do a job, it would be the job I'd most avoid. So how come I'm doing this thing that I really don't like? And I'm doing it and spending quite a lot of time in it. Um, and what we'd realized then was with, because of the way printing technology changed and it was much cheaper to print at that stage if you did large numbers than it used to be, uh, what we could do is, instead of doing an eight-page paper and doing 700 of them and really killing ourselves trying to sell them, we could print 10,000 of a four-page paper for exactly the same amount of money, and we could give those away for free. Um, and so we started doing that, and in the Irish context, like, again, compared to population size with Norway, that's a pretty large number to be doing. So it means with every demonstration, you can pretty much give everybody who comes one uh, we also, in the areas where we lived, we'd go door to door delivering them, um, and also we'd give them out and work. Um, and so there were two things happening there. The other thing that happens is if you're writing a paper like that, so you're writing kind of for your neighbours, you think about the way you're saying stuff much more carefully than if you're writing it for a whole load of other activists, basically. 
Um, at the same time, um, we would got involved around the international support for the Zapatistas. Um, and this is a picture of me at the first Encuentro in, in Chavez in 1996. Um, and that encuentro and the one after it in Spain, a kind of place where a lot of the idea behind the summit protests of the 1990s came out of, um, particularly the Spanish one, actually, because people met up afterwards. Um, and so that meant we were kind of involved in the early bit of that process. Uh, this is Prague in 2000, I think it was, in September in 2000. If you look at me behind, you can probably see me peeking out of the, uh, <laughs> the centre of the picture there. But because we'd, we'd, we'd sort of... I mean, we'd be seen as a more traditional, not quite a syndicalist group, but something along those lines. Like, we're very concerned with workers' struggles and with community struggles. But we saw this movement developing and were involved with it. Plus, we, had to, we now had this paper that we could give to lots of people. Uh, so it meant that when that struggle emerged, uh, we actually had quite a lot of influence in it because we could reach people, we could talk to them, uh, and we'd already been involved in stuff. And so we saw this massive, like in, in the 1990s, we were this tiny organization of five, six people. Uh, but in the, in the summit protest period, uh, we grew very rapidly, probably peaking at about 65 people in, in five cities. So actually a bit like Mokmark today, like similar sort of numbers. Um, and in 2004, we had what was the biggest uh, anarchist demonstration in Ireland to this date, which was in Dublin. It was during the European Union summit there. Um, and we got the police banned of March, which really helped us uh, because that made lots of people angry and it became a freedom of speech issue. Um, and so about 5,000 people came out, um, which was like, wow, okay, so this is really interesting. So we're going somewhere. So that's kind of the, that's a kind of conventional story of what you could sort of be doing anywhere. But of course, then something happened in Ireland. Um, and that something was the, the financial crisis and the global crash. And as people might know, that was very much worse in Ireland than most, most places except the other countries in what are called the pigs, so Portugal, Greece. Um, Italy actually wasn't hit as bad, and Spain was hit about equally bad. Uh, I mean, there's some boring figures on that. Uh, that's the, uh, uh, the deficit, uh, 2007 being the year of the crash. Um, you can see it becoming massive, uh, and national debt also growing at a very similar sort of rate. Um, you'd imagine, and this is part of what I'm talking about here, um, you'd imagine that in that situation, this is, would be the big opportunity if you're a revolutionary organization, you know, because in, in, in the previous boom, you go, well, people aren't going to be radical because they're more or less getting things that they want. Uh, but when that ends and that's all taken away from them, uh, then that's the point they're going to become radical at. Uh, and that didn't happen, right? Um, and what I, so what I'm going to talk about in the, the second part is some of the reasons why, uh, some of what the lessons of that are, and what in terms of new technology you can use to overcome what we identified as some of those problems. Um, so in, in real terms, I mean, the graph gives you one idea of that's what it looks like in terms of the national economy, uh, in terms of its impact on people. Uh, I'm a public sector worker, so my take-home pay nowadays, just for inflation, is about 35% less than it was six years ago. So that's an enormous pay cut. Uh, I'm working longer hours. I have fewer sick days. Uh, you know, so there's been a big erosion in terms of conditions as well. And to a certain extent, I probably got off lucky uh, compared with a lot of people. Uh, we went from having 4% unemployment to having 15% unemployment. And would, it would actually be kind of Spanish Greek figures of 40% youth unemployment, except there's a very strong tradition of emigration in Ireland. So that means about 300,000 people have left the country. So again, its population size is about the same size as Norway. 300,000 people leaving Norway in space of four years for economic reasons would be like, wow, that's, that's a pretty big thing that's happened there. And nearly all of them are young, so it's nearly all under 30. Uh, and in fact, to the government to encourage young people to leave if you're under 25, they cut the amount of uh, social welfare you receive from the state in half. So, we, you know, the joke was that they might as well also have given you a one-way plane ticket, a bus ticket to leave, because uh, they were certainly giving you a clear message. And uh, been huge cuts in both health and education alongside that. Um, so th this, 
so the, I mean, the interesting, the interesting thing that you might hope that the lack of impact we, we managed to have was due to us getting something fundamentally wrong in terms of not understanding what was happening and maybe not reacting to it. But unfortunately, that's not the story. Uh, we had a pretty good analysis from 2007 of how big this was going to be and how badly it was going to hit Ireland. We did have particular weaknesses, like um, most of our membership were young, so we didn't have that many people who were active in unions at the time. Uh, but within about, I'd say, 18 months, most of our members who were in unionized jobs, most in the public sector, had uh, become members of the union branch committee. So I don't know what the equivalent name is in Norway, but it's the, the local level of the union. So. Um, in terms of where decisions are made locally, that, that can be quite important. Um, there's, a, there's a bit of a myth that there wasn't resistance to the crisis in Ireland. I mean, there's a, famously, there was a demonstration in Athens where they were carrying this banner saying, you know, we are not Irish at the front of the unification being that we were just taking all this crap and, and they were going to resist it. it that's not quite true. Um, Though the, there was a public sector strike in November 2009, which saw a quarter of a million workers take part in it. Uh, there were three uh, trade union marches of over 100,000 people in Dublin, or, or, or you know, total to 100,000 uh, around the country. And there was a massive um, community campaign against uh, new local taxes they'd introduced in order to pay back all this money we supposedly owe the banks. So this photograph is the national conference of that community campaign. About 4,000 people had turned up to discuss the winning of it. So again, think about in Norway terms, similar sort of number. That's a pretty big thing to actually be happening. Um, but and, and though the big things, I mean, in, in my memory of 2009, 2010, 2011 was there were demonstrations every week, you know, of 1,000 people, 1,500 people, 2,000 people. So smaller demonstrations were constantly all the time uh, of, of teachers, of hospital workers, of people from communities that were facing cuts. There was, you know, so there was a lot of, of energy and a lot of movement in that period. Um, but what we might have hoped was that something like that would happen people would initially look to the Social Democrats in Ireland, the, the Labour Party, uh, or the trade union leaders, and then they'd become disappointed in them, and then they'd become radicalised, and they start spontaneously taking action, and that's the kind of big opportunity for revolutionaries. But it's not what happened. Um, instead, it became very clear by the start of 2010 that the union leadership had stayed in control within the unions, um, and in later in 2010, this community uh, campaign was uh, defeated. This is its last significant demonstration, in fact, um, which had about 6,000 people on it. Um, so what happened? How did, how, did, how, did, you know, how did capitalism in Ireland manage to control what should have been a really angry movement that should have you know, broken out of the boundaries and other things we can learn about that from elsewhere? There were a few things we've been talking about um, and that we think contain some of the answers to this. Now, the first one is that we think there was there's too much of a reliance up by the left on fights around basic economic issues and the idea that these were radicalised people on a mass base to the point where they, you know, spontaneously break with the current trade union leadership or with uh, reformist parties. That break didn't happen in Ireland. Uh, quite the reverse, when these mass movements reached the point where more serious conflict was needed, people found ways to avoid them. They gave in, and they very often then became demoralised. So they're individually they're sitting at home really angry, but there's nothing happening anymore on a collective basis. Um, so one of the things we've been doing is we've been spending a lot of time the last year or so looking at... Uh, uh, the ideas of intersectionality coming out of the feminist movement and how uh, the intersections between race, class and gender have impacts on who mobilises to fight, who stays to fight, who drops out of it um, and, and how deep that is. Uh, and as I was saying just beforehand, coincidentally last year uh, I um, went to Istanbul initially on the holidays. There was when Gezi Park broke out uh, so I was, I was there for, in fact, the most intense week of that. And one of the really interesting things about Gezi Park was part of its power was that it, it, the, the, the groups who were mobilized within it included the, the Turkish feminist groups um, and LGBT groups, um, as well as more traditional sectors like the nationalists and uh, the unions. Um, actually, in the nationalists in Turkey, that was quite confusing because it was both 
the Kemalists, who were the kind of state nationalists, and then also uh, the Kurds, so all in the same space. It was an interesting thing to watch playing out. The second thing we, we were thinking about was so the nature of work has changed, um, and it means that the there used to be a spontaneous um, or semi-spontaneous urge when you had mass workers struggles to take over the means of production and to continue producing and you know create a new society around it. So if you look at the most really huge struggles of the 1910s or the 1930s, uh, or even into the 1950s, you'd see elements of that within it. Uh, and more recently in Argentina, you saw a small amount of that happening. Um, but th that was very much based around a society where what most people worked at was a job where you were producing things that had an obvious use to other people around you. Um, you know, and you didn't have a huge amount of stuff either. So it was relatively easy if you're, uh, to imagine continuing production and taking the hammers you're making or whatever and exchanging them with other workers in the same city or with farmers outside and uh, producing things like that. We saw a number of workplace occupations in Ireland over the last um, four years. In fact, this one was just last, uh, well, two weeks ago now. Just We won it just as we left it, but as I, I left. Uh, but uh, what they were about was where a workplace got shut down. Um, the workers weren't paid their final wages, typically, or they weren't paid redundancy. In this case, the, these workers were three months' wages. Um, and the only thing they could do in order to try and claim those wages was to occupy the, the workplace to stop uh, tools and machinery being removed because that's valuable, uh, and to try and demand that they get paid. Um, and in this particular case, they actually they won and they got paid, but the um, that doesn't have the same sort of logic of, of extending itself and sort of creating a new society in the shell of the old. You win, you get your money, and then that's it, it's over. Um, this is, uh, yep, yeah, so we had uh, a meeting about two years ago uh, where we, we were sort of discussing some of these ideas, and we were also trying to understand how we changed as an organization, because we used to be the sort of group that had imagined the way you do things is you work out what it is you want to do, uh, then everybody gets involved in doing it, and we realized we kind of stopped doing that. Uh, and a lot of that was to do with the way things get organized nowadays. So a lot of things actually get organized on things like Facebook and stuff, right? And you don't, So you don't need somebody in an office ringing people up to say, oh, there's going to be a demonst demonstration on next Tuesday, can you go? People see these things as, as pages or events or whatever else. And we'd started doing this without even thinking about it. So one of the things we said, well, what is it that we're actually doing now? Um, so we did this kind of interesting mapping exercise where everybody wrote down on a piece of paper what they were involved in. Uh, and then we kind of stacked all those bits and you know drew them up into a big diagram and found out that actually yeah there was there was lots of stuff it's probably a little bit hard to read that but uh, you know so there's like a range of union issues uh, community stuff anti patriarchal struggles uh, international solidarity anti racist struggles student struggles and then uh, environmental stuff as well and that kind of then describes what our actual activity was but we didn't really know what it was in terms of planning. Um, and because of that, we were sort of looking at all that, and we also realized that we'd, we'd set up a Facebook page just because everybody does it uh, sometime around 2010. Um, and we hadn't really been thinking, we'd no plan or strategy with what we were doing with that, but it already picked up quite a lot of people, a couple of thousand people following us. So we thought, okay, well, this is interesting because lots of people are actually organizing around this. It's not the way we organize, um, it's quite new, but how can we, you know, maybe we can actually do something. Uh, that will enable us to reach more people with it. Um, and in fact, what we've now done is we've decided to get rid of that paper we used to print where we were doing 10,000 copies of it. And we're, we're in terms of actually presenting news on a day-to-day -day basis, we've concentrated on using our Facebook page as our main um, device for doing it. So the interesting thing about that is that, it, so this is a list of all the Irish um, political organizations, so both the radical left, but also the government organizations. Um, and second from the top is ourselves. With, we now have 26,000 people um, following us on Facebook. And all the government parties are all down here at the bottom. Um, in fact, we're the current government is a coalition government, so there's more people following us than all the government <laughs> party uh, pages. So it's kind of a weird thing. What exactly does that mean? Um, well, for us, what it means is it's given us the ability to communicate with a, a, a very large number of people. Uh, 
This is from about a month ago. Um, and in, yeah, so it's over a period of about a month, something like uh, 250,000 people in Ireland saw something we sent to the page. Um, you need to add together the Irish figure and some of the United Kingdom figure, because the six counties in the north are counted in the United Kingdom. Um, and that, like, if you think about it, that's, that's like, most left-wing organizations. If you had some way of reaching a quarter of a million people on a semi-regular basis, that would actually be quite a big deal. So it, it, that's the other area we've been looking at uh, in terms of just trying to, like, the, the way we used to give out leaflets or other pieces of paper to try and communicate randomly with people who might come through their doorway, box they read it and get interested. We're now trying to do a lot of that online. The, third, the other thing we're doing is... I think one of the problems traditional revolutionary organizations had was how did they engage with people who weren't members, right? And the standard thing most of them did was they, well, they, you tried to get people to become a member. And if they didn't become a member, then what you could communicate with them was actually quite limited. I mean, you could have your newspaper, um, but back in the days when the only way to tell people a meeting was on was to put a piece of paper in an envelope, lick the envelope, put a stamp on the front and stick it in a post box. Uh, if you were a small volunteer organization, you couldn't really do that with hundreds of people. It would, you know, it would cost too much and actually would take up a lot of time doing all the envelope licking. Uh, but nowadays with email, uh, you can obviously do that almost instantaneously. Um, and one problem with that, is I, don't, I don't know if this happens here, but it certainly happens in Ireland, is you get... Uh, radical organizations who basically just harvest everybody's email address they can and then just send them an email about absolutely everything they're actually doing and it's like it's really annoying to just spam, you don't need any of it, uh, you throw it all out. Um, so we've been looking at that and trying to find ways of avoiding that trap but at the same time having some methods of communication that can reach lots of people. Um, and so what we've been thinking about is rather than thinking of people as just being members and not members, uh, thinking about it as there's a set of spheres of engaging with people, right? And at the outermost ones are people following us on Facebook and Twitter, which is 26,000 plus 4,000 people at the moment. And, you know, they got some really casual interest. They probably, they liked something we posted at some stage and they're following us ever since. Um, and that's kind of useful because we can keep getting news items out to those people and interacting with them and they may become more interested over time. But you've got to be realistic about that. It's just this really kind of casual like level of interest in something on a Facebook page or whatever else. Um, then we have a, what we call contacts, which are people who've given us their email address and have also told us what areas of struggle they're interested in. So it might be anti-racist struggle, it might be environmentalist struggle, uh, it might be gender, and also what sort of activities. Like they might like postering, they might like doing stalls, they might like organizing protests. And we have a, so we have a system that you can say, well, okay, I want you to send an email to people in Dublin who are interested in anti-racism and like putting up posters. And so they just get that mail. So they don't get 20 mails from us a week saying we're doing this, we're doing this, we're doing this. They just get one or two mails a month talking about the stuff they're specifically interested in. Um, and the, the last thing we, we came to was that with our own membership, we put a, an awful lot of emphasis on ideological training. So, you know, when people joined, we thought it was really important that they understand things about the Russian Revolution, the Spanish Revolution, or all that stuff left organizations tend to be obsessed with and maybe isn't that useful. It's kind of use, useful to know, but not that useful. And we hadn't put anything like enough work into uh, skills like journalism, photography, facilitating meetings, those sort of things. So we also started putting a lot of work into those, those areas, and we do regular training things on that. Um, anyway, so that's, uh, that's the kind of thing I, I have more or less as a way of starting a discussion, because I was coming over, I was aware that I wouldn't really know who I was talking to, and people would have take different things out of that as being interesting, some bits are really boring, some bits you'll find interesting, and that's going to vary all over the place. So it's kind of just to get people thinking, and then to see what you think about that, uh, what questions you may have. So well, one of the part of the reason I was talking about that Facebook reach thing is that we realised part of the problem with the uh, union branch situation was that where we had members, we could convince people in those branches. Where we hadn't, we'd no real way of reaching people. Uh, I mean, we we did do one of the photographs I showed was uh, was one of our leaflets we did for one of the hundred thousand strong union marches. And we 
you know, gave out, I think, about 10,000 leaflets at that. So we were trying to do that sort of thing, but that's of, it's of limited use because basically it's some random person you don't know giving you some long piece of text on the street that you might read and go, oh, that's quite insightful, but probably less than 100 people, one in 100 people do, maybe much less than that. Um, and we realised one of the advantages we had with social media stuff is people would keep seeing stuff from us. So in fact, I mean, what our experience basically is there'll be some big protest or campaign, we'll be reporting on that. So lots of people will start following us because they're involved in that struggle. But when that ends, they'll still be following us. And whatever the next thing is, they'll also be getting it. So over time, uh, they'll get to know who we are and hopefully have some level of trust when we say something that might be true or it's worth considering. Um, so that's one level. The, the other level we realized was quite weak. That, that membership cliff between people who were members and people who went, and you had to jump up this huge cliff to get from one to the other. One of the, the really negative things in that situation was that it meant that while we probably had a periphery of a couple of hundred people at least who were somewhat interested in what we just say, somewhat trusting, we had no mechanism for actually uh, mobilizing those people to help us in terms of uh, you know, union arguments or whatever else. Um, so the part of the, the reason we, we developed this spheres of engagement idea was to actually have a way of reaching out to those people and, and have a situation where they were used to being reached out to and we were only doing it in situations where they said, yes, I want you to contact me about this. We weren't doing it randomly and annoying people. Um, so, I mean, the, the, the centre of that is basically a, a, a complex email program that we now have about 800 people nationally on it and enables us to send them specific communications. And uh, a lot of what we do is actually asking them if they'll help us out with things. So we recently had an anarchist book fair in Dublin and I think we had 35 volunteers uh, from that helped us with particular aspects of organising that. So that's kind of like quite a positive result because it means we have to do less work and also lots more work can actually be done. Um, the real pity with all this sort of stuff is that, is that we hadn't got it developed in 2007 because when, then we'd have had a hell of a test of it for three years and I'd be able to go, yeah, that really works or not. It, uh, whereas since, since we've developed it, not so much has been happening. I mean, the main test we've had was there was a big uh, pro-choice struggle about two years ago in Ireland after uh, a woman who was refused an abortion in one of the Irish hospitals died. Um, and there was a lot of anger at that point, but there wasn't that much of a, a, a pro-choice movement existing. That, you know, there was one going back 20 years, there'd been sporadic activity. Uh, but using social media, uh, the kind of the network of people who did pre-exist, which wasn't very many people, maybe 15, 20 people, uh, did manage to call, call a sequence of demonstrations, the biggest of which was about 20,000. And the government were then forced to introduce some very limited circumstance uh, abortion in Ireland, which is that... Like, I mean, the way we present that is it's a very big defeat for the, the kind of anti-abortion movement because finally there's some. It's not a big deal for us, though, because it's almost meaningless. Um, so that was one test of it. Um, did that answer what you're asking me? Or? <laughs> a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> The actual requirements for, I mean, we, we still think that in order for a, a, an organization to function at a level that it can have quite a lot of intense activity and be still remain a democratic organization in which all members actually discuss things and have an equal say, you do need quite a high uh, commitment in order to be a member. Um, so that, we haven't actually uh, changed that as such. What we've instead done is built out these other ways of communicating with people. Uh, and uh, uh, engaging with them and, you know, getting the information going back and forth. Uh, we, in fact, with the last, because of all this internal discussion we've been having, we essentially stopped accepting new members in the last 18 months anyway. Um, so, you know, it's, we've never been a very recruitment-driven organization. Like, the, the joke was that people would often say that to join us, they'd have to chase us for weeks, you know, and saying it repeatedly, and eventually we'd be like, oh, okay, so we should join. Um, which is not necessarily a great thing either. But uh, in the last last 18 months, we really haven't been focusing on that as well. So, you know, what, how much this stuff will affect membership once we start recruiting again, I, I, I honestly don't know. Are you using uh, some tactics for uh, your organization's work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, basically because they, they told us they're interested in doing particular things. Like, so with the contacts, what we're basically saying to people is, tell us what you're interested in. 
uh, give us contact details for you. We're not expecting any sort of commitments whatsoever from you, but we'll, we'll send you emails when there's something to be done. And if at that point in the time you have the energy to do it, get back to us and then you can help us out with it. So it's very, very loose like that. Yeah, I wondered whether you have to be uh, whether you have to be like uh, women's pressure uh, assignment where uh, they uh, work almost on half of their professional hours or not, no, no, not really. I mean, well, the, I mean, a, a task might be with the Amateurs Book Fair staffing the front desk that people come in the door and, and you know, getting contact details in turn of, of, of people who are visiting. So that's kind of administrative, but no, it's not really, you know, it's not designed to be an ongoing kind of, uh, it's not, not an equivalent of, I guess, an intern program or something like that, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, we, we kind of, like, I mean, the way we're structured is we, we're completely volunteer. We've nobody who's paid staff at all. Um, uh, so the administration thing is so that basically means you can't really have any sort of managerial structure where people are checking up on whether or not other people have done work. So you definitely need to know that the people doing administrative work have quite a high level of commitment because obviously if you have somebody doing administrative work and they stop doing it, that can cause chaos all over the place because you're generally not even aware they've stopped. It's just suddenly become you hit problems and you're like, hey, how's that happening? And then you realise that's what the cause of it is. Yes, you can't really read these, but uh, so I, I'll not even I can't read it. Um, so Dublin, there, it, it's for that month, it's about sixty-two thousand people, which is fair enough because Dublin's one and a half million people, so uh, you'd expect it to be most. And then the next one is Cork with about twenty thousand. Cork's the second biggest city, and in fact, when I looked down that list, um, it it turned. It, well, in fact, when I looked at people who engaged with it, so they actually liked, they commented, or they shared, uh, it was basically of the first 30 cities, 27 of them were Irish. Uh, London was in there as well, um, which is probably a mixture of a lot of Irish people living in London, and, and uh, a lot of Irish, and uh, London's quite close to us, so there's probably some people interested as well. But no, it, it, it went right down to really small um, towns. Um, and like in a couple of cases, it was quite encouraging. Like there's a, a town called Waterford in, in Southern Ireland where there's a really big kind of popular but unorganized anti-Roma racism yeah. stuff happening at the moment. And we realized that we'd about 6,000 people were seeing stuff there. So, you know, even though we'd no members there, it gave us some sort of hope of trying to influence some of the, some of the discussion that was happening around that. But uh, no, it, it's like one of the encouraging things is like normally it's impossible to, or very hard to reach into more rural places. Uh, but the statistics seem to suggest that actually you, we've got quite a good reach in, in, into those areas now. Isn't it also a bit hard to know uh, how well it's working? I mean, uh, it's so dependent on other factors, right? I mean, it's very difficult to say what, what would it have been like in terms of people getting involved with something like the financial crisis since we never experienced anything quite like this before. Mm -hmm. um, do you have, do you think you have strong evidence that this is working in some way, given that there are all these natural ups and downs in terms of why people might get involved and why they might be motivated? Um, so, <laughs> so one of the things we do when we do events is we ask people where do they hear about them. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, with big things like the book fair, just as I said, you get about 800 people to, we find about 40% plus, we'll say, Facebook. About 25% will actually say a friend. Uh, and then people, some people have seen posters we put up. I mean, we put a lot of effort into postering for us. It's actually quite expensive. Um, and then sometimes there'll be other things there as well. So, yeah, I, th I think actually, like, it's one of the things the left tends to be quite bad at. But actually, whenever you do stuff, trying to get some real feedback in terms of, you know, did, who noticed it, how did they notice it, you know, what, what did actually work, not just what do we think is actually working, and, and getting those sort of things coming back in again. Um, that's not actually the book fair one. I mean, the other interesting thing about the book fair one is we ask people how would they describe themselves politically, and we give them a range of 
choices, anarchist, Marxist, socialist, feminist, environmentalist, mixture of them all, you can, you can circle the lot. So you, we can also see results according to different types of advertising campaigns we've, we've uh, run in relation to that. Um, I mean, basically, it's kind of like they, we're concentrating on the Facebook end of this now, but it's, 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 it's more of an argument for um, a multi-layered method of engagement that doesn't rely on a single tool and recognizes that some tools are really powerful for convincing people and they're the conversational ones. And some tools are really powerful for reaching out to lots of people. And at the moment, that's Facebook. And then there's other things in between that can also be useful. So, you know, rather than just having a, you know, the answer is conversations. The answer is Facebook or whatever approach to do it. Because I mean, we've done, um, if people are familiar with the, the American Trade Unions, the organizer conversation training stuff, I mean, we've, we've also used some of that in relation to that community campaign, for instance, I was talking about. So you're going around knocking people's doors or whatever. It's basically, it, it's formalizing a conversational method that helps to get people to commit to actually doing something. That's what it's actually based on. It's been used quite effectively in trade union organizing in the States, but take, you know, it obviously takes a lot of time per individual. Um, so circumstance-wise, that sort of thing also can. Okay, well, we do, we publish, um, we stopped publishing the newspaper, which we used to, the free newspaper, so when we did 10,000 of them, we did it every two months, but actual distribution work was quite a lot of effort still. I mean, it was much more effective than selling, you know, instead of distributing five in an hour, you could distribute 500, so that was a good improvement, it was still quite a bit. But we still publish a magazine twice a year, uh, we do 3,000 copies of that, and but that's also free. Uh, and we uh, distribute that at the London and Dublin Anarchist Book Fairs. Uh, and it basically consists of longer, more opinionated, you know, more, more theoretical pieces uh, aimed at people that are fairly interested in um, anarchist ideas. Now, all that also goes on the web. Um, the, the, I guess the issue with trying to do a, a, a public-facing mass printed paper is always going to be uh, distribution, um, you know, like to get enough for it. Like the, 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 if you think about the, the crisis, like one of the reasons we started thinking about this was our experience of the crisis in Ireland was their actual analysis was quite good. Like we understood in 2007 what was going to happen, how bad it was going to be, how the trade union leadership would react, all that sort of thing. But our problem was communicating that with any number of people to make a difference, you know. So, um, Say I, I, we probably had members in maybe 12 union branches, for instance, and in those branches, along with other people on the radical left, you know, we, over a period of two or three months, we convinced people of what was probably likely to happen, and they all would, you know, when there'd be votes on strategy, those branches would vote the right way, but there'd be, like, there were thousands of branches in the country, so 12 branches don't make much of a difference. So how did we reach, you know, how could we reach those other branches? And we tried doing that through printed leaflets and distributing them at demonstrations and stuff. But that's, you know, like if you if you don't know who's giving you a leaflet, it's just some random person who's handed you something that you may or may find interesting at that moment. And then two weeks later, you might remember it or you might not. And you probably won't have any way of contacting people. Um, so, I mean, that's one of the reasons we got, you know, we're more excited about the kind of social media following thing because people keep getting stuff from us that way and build up a set of interactions with us. And, you know, you would hope that their experience of those interactions is positive, so therefore they, it also builds trust. You know, they think, well, those guys were right six months ago, and they were right three months ago, so maybe what they're saying today is right, even though it sounds a bit old to me. Uh, you know, that sort of thing. But, um, I mean, I think the idea, like, print again would be better. <laughs> you know, if, if every day you could put a printed newspaper through everybody's letterbox, that would be amazingly effective, but it's just almost impossible for, you know, to do uh, as a volunteer organization. If you're a billionaire, you can do it. But, you know, the reality of our media is that it's owned by people with vast amounts of money who can pay for television stations. A lot of newspapers in Ireland make lose money. They're not profit-making. But, the, like, the main newspaper group is owned by the same family who owned the, the main oil exploration company. So, you know, how are they going to cover our struggles around the oil exploration? Well, <laughs> not very well. It's not that much of a surprise, you know. So, how, you know, how do you start to overcome some of these things? 
Um, you, you know, the best solution normally isn't going to be available to you. It's, it's a question of, well, you know, what can we do with the resources we have available? Do you think uh, you have to... Is your organisation explicitly anarchist more than it's Marxist, for example? Yeah, we define ourselves as being anarchist. Um, the, I mean, a relationship with... We actually, well, we, we kind of read why widely <laughs> so we'd look at a lot of different currents and sort of go what's interesting happening out there what can we actually take from it but i mean we define ourselves as anarchist rather than marxist basically over the issue of the role of the state and the revolutionary organization and you know what that has fallen down on historically on one side or another so it's a kind of handy shorthand uh, as much as anything else but, but i mean the, the reason i ask that is because i just wonder if you feel like you have a kind of cultural advantage in some way because uh, if you're interested, if you're influenced by uh, anarchist ideas, you've got a slight, maybe a slightly different approach to organisation, say, from if you're more of a Marxist-Leninist kind of organisation or a Trotskyist organisation, like the Socialist Workers' Party, that, I mean, these forms of organisation tend to be flatter, they tend to be mm. less hierarchical, they tend to be less party-like. I mean, does that help, do you think, on a practical level? Yeah, well, the, there's definitely a really interesting thing that's happened in terms of technology has made horizontal organisation much more um, effective and much more possible for people. So it seems a much real, real solution. And so there's a general transformation of culture in general I think in, in, in that sort of direction so I think that's definitely helpful for us but I, it sometimes gets a bit overstated like people sort of say okay well we're definitely on our way to utopia now with the internet what's going to save us all or whatever so that that's the, the only note of caution I have is I don't want to sound like I'm saying that but uh, yeah it, it's like you don't you know like the problem with the, the old technology like the party newspaper right if you wanted to, so if you wanted to be able to communicate your ideas to ten thousand people, you had to get your article in the party paper. That meant your existing party leadership had to like that article. Um, you know that it, the the only way that could get out is look through lots of people putting in money to pay for it and then selling it. And nowadays you can have a blog and maybe it'll be popular because what you're writing is sensible. It's a completely different sort of mechanism. So the, the possibilities I think have definitely changed, and it also, I mean, the thing that's really noticeable in relation to organizations like the SWP is that they used to do quite a strong job of stopping their members communicating horizontally. Uh, you know, everything went up and down through the party thing. That enabled you to keep quite a tight line on things. And of course, in recent years, that's collapsed because it's really easy for members to communicate horizontally through Facebook or email lists or anything else. And that's had some really powerful impacts on the organization without getting into all the details. Um, you know, and I, I think that's interesting. Like, there's definitely, you know, the 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 need, if you like, for centralization, which I think anarchists would have always argued with us. You know, whether or not that need was, was really as strong as it was, but it appears to be very much less than it ever was. I think this question was more more solidarity is also just horizontal way. Wasn't the question? Well, I also wondered, like, if you if you theoretically. Um, orientated in any case to a flatter form of organisation, maybe that helps you use the, the opt new opportunities that technology yeah. is providing more effectively. Yeah, yeah, well, instead of fighting against them, we're going, oh, great, we can do this. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, no, no, I think that's definitely true. I mean, yeah, because, yeah, I mean, the, yeah, the reaction of, of like, a, a lot of more, yeah, a lot of more party-type formations to the early days of the internet was to tell the members they were allowed to use it, you know, like for party communication or whatever. So, uh, whereas anarchists are much more tempted to look at it and go, "Oh, this is brilliant!" You know, and embrace it and find ways to to, to work through it. I'm not so sure about this one <laughs> <laughs> um, because uh, we in uh, Tulsa, uh, the forty people who got um, on the plane. Charged. Charged. Yeah, uh, was picked out from our Facebook event. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we, not, we, we can't use that anymore to spread information uh, about something that's going on. I 
another thing is that you know that Facebook is uh, reading all you're doing. So I don't, I don't think it's safe using Facebook to inform people about what's going on. Another thing is that Facebook is taking a lot of money to uh, put your post in the feed. Um. So, so I don't know. Uh, I'm skeptic to the whole Facebook thing in the future. Because when I see a ben benign need to get people to um, participate in things, I call them, I send them SMS, emails, talk to them. I'm not using Facebook anymore. Mm. So, uh, what do you think about the future of Facebook's algorithm? Right, so I, I, I think that that's actually a great illustration, I think, of of the problem, the way we're approaching these things at the moment, which is people are either being very, this is fantastic, I'm critical of them, or going, ooh, I really don't like that, I'm not touching it at all. Um, the, I mean, I, I think the reality is that there's different methods of communication that you use according to what you actually intend to do, right? And yeah, I, I think if you're organizing something that people kind of caught injunctions served on them as a result of or whatever else, then yeah, Facebook isn't a good mechanism for doing that at all. It's really visible. Um, you know, people can go looking for three or four days afterwards and manage to track back what happened if, if it's a public sort of thing. It's not really good. If if what you're doing is is um, it's I mean the way we treat our pages is basically like a, a newspaper, right? So we put stories on it. People get to read the stories. People get to interact with the stories. But it's not really it's not apart from getting people to public meetings. So we we'll advertise public meetings on it. But if we were doing blockades or any sort of action, we wouldn't do it that way at all. Um, we'd use other methods, basically. Um, so I, I think it's more a question of what is it you want to achieve in terms of a particular thing, and then what tool works the best. Like, I mean, what, what we try and do is move people from, um, yeah, from being kind of like in that outer layer Facebook contacts to being email contacts to being supporters. Um, and according to what we're doing, we'd be using one of those things uh, rather than necessarily a public thing. But the, what, the, what Facebook means for us, though, is uh, this is actually a story I did when we went through Tronline, is that we can reach you know, really huge quantities of people. So in that case, 21,000 uh, or whatever. Yeah, but it's a thing that they use. Well, the, the level of engagement suggests that a lot of them do. I mean, I, you know, like, I, yeah, that 21,000 means it showed up in 21,000 yeah. people's profiles. It doesn't mean 21,000 yeah. people read it. But what, what we consistently, you know, if you have 12,000 people actually interacting with the story, right, then, you know, they've, they've read it at some sort of level. Um, so I think what we, I mean, the way we look at the, the, the Facebook thing is basically it's a bit like a, a page is a bit like having a tabloid newspaper, right? You can put up lots of, short little things or a photograph or whatever else and you're hoping with each of those that maybe you nudge the people who see it slightly in the direction you want them to go you're not going to make some sort of huge you know they're not, they're not going to have a, a moment of going oh my god suddenly i've rethought everything i've ever thought about in the world uh, but each campaign we're involved in people involved in that campaign will follow our page because we're providing quite good news in it uh, and then well something else happens they'll still be there and that so over time that's why we've accumulated uh, so many people so it's like yeah as a as an actual organizing tool it's really limited but as a newspaper it certainly has been quite useful for us uh, i hope you don't think that email systems are safe <laughs> from computers. uh no i i to be honest uh because of the i mean because of the tradition of, of struggle in Ireland and the fact that a lot of it has been clandestine and stuff. Um, yeah, I, I, I basically think anything that's online is insecure. Um, you know, I actually don't even trust most encryption stuff with all that S NSA type thing um, that's been going on. Um, but it's uh, it, it has the same, I mean, if you're running the system yourself, um, it, it has the same sort of advantage that you're talking about you know, chat having like it, it's a bit harder to intercept. But uh, yeah, I'd always I'd always work in the assumption they probably are intercepting things, but you know, in, in lots of cases they won't want to reveal that. Um, I mean, what we do with um, so I mean, the way we use it basically is uh, with Facebook, we're kind of building out that sort of popular paper type idea. 
we use it to bring people to big public events like the Dublin Managers Book Fair. There's about 800 people go to that each year now. And then the people who turn up at that, we encourage them to sort of leave us an email address and other contact details and tell us specifically what sort of work they're interested in. Uh, and the reason we do that is I think one of the standard errors left-wing organisations make with email communication is they get people's email address, they file them all into this huge pile, and then they send them an email about every single bloody thing they're doing, and drive you insane, and you stop reading the email because you're getting you know, like 10 of them a week or something. Um, so what we do is we actually just send mails out to people in the areas they've told us they're actually interested in, uh, which means they don't get, you know, we don't mail them all that often at all. And we normally mail them asking them specifically to, you know, to do something to help us out in some way. And that, that's worked really well for us. I mean, we've got about 700 people in that system now. And we find with, uh, you know, we'll often get 10 or 15 people volunteering to help out with particular projects when we send a mail out. Uh, or if it's something big like the book fair, more people, we suppose we provide volunteers for the last one. So it's useful for particularly small groups where you know you have a lot of kind of people who are quite sympathetic but don't want to commit to actual membership uh, to sort of, you know, find ways where when they have the energy and they're motivated by something that they can visit, it makes it really easy to communicate with them and get them to actually give a hand. So we are Um, I, I, we use this thing called Civic CRM, um, which is uh, that's contact relations management, I think it is, uh, which it's an it's a, it's a open source add-on to Drupal. But one of the things it actually does try and do is track how many people open mails. Now, it's an underestimation because uh, you know if you've got your mail set up, you may not be particularly trackable. But we find, yeah, that the, the reported opening rate varies from about 80% to 25% depending on, on the, the, exactly how it's titled and things. So uh, the answer appears to be so far yes. Uh, but I think that's partially because we're, we are careful with the targeting. So, you know, people are probably only seeing the mail coming from us every month or two. Um, you know, so it's, it's a novelty rather than a, oh, another one. Um, but I mean, we also, like, as I said, we also have, with, with people who are closer to us, we'll also have their phone numbers and stuff. So we'll, you know, because like, I mean, the, the, yeah, the thing that always works best is obviously a one-to-one -one conversation with somebody, right? Like the, that, that's always the most powerful organizing method. The problem is, though, that particularly as a volunteer organization, you can't have one-to-one -one conversations with the 27,000 people following you on Facebook. You know, you, uh, it's an impossibility. So communication methods are going to be compromises. Um, and what's possible now, basically, is to have those compromises not involving vast amounts of work, which they would have involved 20 years ago, or vast amounts of money, which, you know, you know 20 years ago would have been the reality of trying to talk to 27,000 people. So, you know, if you think about where people are in relation to your organization and how you can best communicate with them, you know, like that, that you know, because basically means you can then have a, a subset that you do those one-to-one -one conversations with. Um, So, so the way we basically extended the way we worked with printed publications, and then realised we had to modify it as we as we started to go online. Right. So, with uh, printed publications, we elect uh, a group of people at each conference, and their job is to be the editorial group. Um, so, you know, they their job is to edit articles basically and, and to uh, look for them. Uh, we started we started publishing online, to, so we just simply copied that model initially. But then after a while, we realized that with online publication, the thing that's really important is speed. And that kind of slows things down, so, down too much. So we changed the editorial group's uh, role as to instead of being to edit before publication, uh, just to look at something, say whether or not it was, you know, wasn't a massive contradiction with the way we thought collectively. And if it wasn't, it just got published. And then if, what, if somebody thought there was a problem with it, then there could be a discussion and maybe you know, it might get pulled at some later date practically has never happened. But uh, so we, we've kind of switched to a method of uh, the assumption is that everything's going to get published. Um, 
and that's but that's partially based on the fact that we spend quite a lot of time working at collectively where a lot of political positions are a conference and in some detail so that certainly for the sort of stuff I'm talking about we are doing three paragraph reports on strike or deportation or whatever it might be I mean what we should be saying in relation to that is really kind of obvious you know if you remember then there's not there's not really going to be any sort of disagreement around that um, yeah and we, we I mean we're we're fairly relaxed anyway about imposing a collective position on longer theoretical stuff. You know, like we're much more inclined to say it's useful to have a range of voices. We recognise what the organisational position is, but we're not going to get terribly upset if somebody says something that's not completely fit into that, uh, unless it's kind of, you know, something that we're starting to consider counterproductive that might become an issue. But, uh, yeah, so it's a bit of a different approach. I think that is quite important, though, because the, like, in terms of getting uh, people interacting with stuff and then lots of other people seeing it, you want to be able, you want to be at the start of the news cycle. Like, you know, with a lot of stuff what we're doing now, we, we're reporting it pretty much as far as state media is reporting it. And if what we're reporting is significantly different from state media, then if you get, you know, if you get a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand people seeing that at the same time that they're hearing the complete opposite on the newspaper or the television that actually has some sort of impact on them if three days later they go, oh, actually, those guys will tell the truth. And, you know, the radio's now changed it, 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 its line completely. But to do that, you can't do an editorial process that takes two days because, you know, five people have to sign off and so on. So. Right, so I think part of the reason, uh, this, is, this is specific to Ireland, well, not specific to Ireland, it's, it's true in lots of countries, but uh, uh, neoliberalist ideology has become very much internalized by, by workers in Ireland, like they accept a lot of the basic premises of it. Um, and that tends towards individual solutions when people find themselves in problems. Um, so there were always two counteracting forces. One was for collective resistance, which had a certain amount of popularity, and another one was for putting your head down, trying to save money, maybe emigrating. Um, the, 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 um, one of our big problems was the, both the Social Democrats and the unions are currently led by people who came from quite a radical revolutionary party in the 1970s. Uh, Sinn Féin, the Workers' Party, for anyone who's familiar with Irish history. Um, and unfortunately, those people have a very sort of good knowledge of, of, of how people become radicalized, how those, because they went through that sort of process themselves, and now they're on the other side. So you have a sort of classic poacher turned gamekeeper problem, you know, where the person who used to poach is the gamekeeper, so they know all the tra tricks the poachers have. Um, so they were very much able to say, say the right sort of stuff to sound radical, but then to kind of scare people about what the implications were of going on strike, for instance. Um, and, and, and scare people that way. The biggest problem, though, was really that the ourselves and the rest of the, the revolutionary left were tiny organizations. Um, so I said it's very weak in Ireland. So we had a situation where after a year of the crisis, we had maybe 18 members who'd become active at local level in unions and at that level could you know, convince people of things. But the problem was that was maybe like 16 union branches and there was a thousand union branches in the country. So you can't win much by, by convincing 16. So those, those were some of the reasons. The, I, I think the other reasons, though, were the ones that um, the, I mean, people were hit very hard by the crisis, but they weren't hit to the point where they were facing starvation, say. Um, so people were weighing up the costs of resistance versus, you know, not resisting. So in where I worked, um, so this is public sector, uh, you know, we had a one-day strike, and then it looked like we were going to have a, a, a strike for a week. But a lot of people were going, oh, I can't afford to go on strike for a week. You know, I lose a week's pay, which was true. It, it does cost a lot. But what we were going on strike for was a pay cut that would amount to 17 days' pay in a year. Um, so really, if you thought you had any chance of winning at all, well, yeah, lose a week's pay to, to keep 17 days. That's, that's simple maths. That makes sense. Um, but, you know, people went... Um, they, they, they weren't thinking at that level. And part of the problem we had was we'd had social partnership for 20 years beforehand. So when we went on strike, nobody, this is a workplace where we had, we had 800 junior members. There was nobody in there who had actually been on strike previously. 
um, you know, so there was the people kind of in a panic about how you organize pickets and things. <laughs> but it was kind of, you know, even even on, on that sort of trivial level. So there was that problem as well. So there's, there's kind of a whole a whole stack of different things interacting. Like Ireland wasn't a particularly tough situation because of that. It was particularly hard. But even in even the other countries that were hit hard by the crisis, like uh, Greece or Spain, you did see much more militant reactions. You had, you know, you had rioting, or you also had the multiple general strikes in those countries. But it was also the case that those movements were contained within. They were more radical because they were doing a general, general strike instead of a protest march. But it wasn't becoming a bigger strike. It wasn't, you know, breaking outside of those boundaries. So the same sort of calculations seem to be going in. Um, I mean, part, part of the thing with this that I'm very aware of is we have, <laughs> we, we've, we've come up with a lot of questions and we've come up with lots of problems and we haven't come up with very many solutions. Um, but I think the part of the process of this sort of thing is, is at first having the honesty to go, things didn't work as we expected, we, that's not good, it means that there's something fundamentally wrong in what we're doing and we need to understand what that might be. Uh, but so far we're just the first half of that equation, so... Uh, Mark uh, Bray was here to my uh, you know, and he said that um, one of the problems with Occupy was that uh, it didn't have any clear goals that uh, were in relation to common people's problems, you know, like mm. uh, some small victories that I could have concrete victories. Mm. Do you have like, any concrete cases in, for example, in Ireland in terms of the financial crisis and problems you have in Ireland that could mobilize people, could engage people that they could see as like, an improvement in their life? That, uh, that's one of the strategies we're looking at at the moment is to do something like the I mean the Seattle Solidarity Network is the most well known I think of these but the idea of trying to set up a, an organisation in a city, like a broad organisation that takes on uh, the relatively simple easy to win fights particularly things around say wage theft so it's where you, you haven't been paid the wages you owed uh, or, or where landlords are breaking local laws you know so there are things that it should be possible to win um, and we're actually in the process of, of doing that at the moment so I don't know how it's working because we've only started uh, I mean the it's not the case that there were no victories, though. There were quite a lot of, like, th those workplace occupation type things where people hadn't been paid wages, a lot of those did actually win. Like, they didn't necessarily get everything back. That The, the recent Paris Bakery one I was talking about, uh, they were owed three months, and they got about, they ended up getting about, I think, two months each. But they did, you know, that's still much, much better than nothing, and, and it's a sense of actually winning. And there, there have been several of those over the years. The problem with them, I think, though, is that, okay, you win that, but it's not necessarily an example other people can take up unless they're also being, you know, losing their jobs and not being paid. So I think because the first few won, it has become quite a standard thing to do, but it hasn't inspired other types of struggles out of it. Um, does that answer? Yeah. yeah. We've, we've had a couple of strange experiences where articles have appeared in newspapers that seem to be very similar to stuff we've published online, <laughs> uh, which I suspect is lazy journalism, people just ripping stuff off. The Irish media is, for the most part, it's very conservative. Like, the vast bulk of it is owned by one family. Uh, then there's the state sector, which is very tightly controlled by the state. Uh, and then the, there's an independent newspaper, which is quite right-leaning as well. So, I mean, sympathetic coverage from the the media is hard enough. Um, and in fact, like one of the campaigns I was involved in was, it was called Shelter Sea, and it was a struggle against uh, oil refining in the west of Ireland, but also against the terms under which we give our gas and oil away. Um, because it's, the funny thing is we use Norway as a, you know, oh, that's the way it should be, you know, because like basically the way it is in Ireland is the, um, the, they pay, the, ta the companies are expected to pay 25% tax on profit after they've removed all course, but of course everybody knows corporations are experts at shifting around where course happened. And Big Ireland's already famous as like a, you know, one of the tax avoidance headquarters of the world. That's why we get Google and Facebook there because they can pull all sorts of dodgy stuff. So in practice that means we get nothing. But in, we couldn't get that story into the media at all. You know, like loads of press work. So what we ended up doing was printing a kind of four page, you know, four page that size leaflet, like, you know, nice colour, all the rest. 
and getting something like 150,000 of them distributed by volunteers. Uh, and the fact that it was so, the fact that it, like lots of people knew about the story in the media wasn't covered, it actually really helped with distribution because people would just contact us and you know, say, give me another 300 or whatever, blah, blah, blah. And they all went out with that sort of number. Uh, but yeah, so our success in getting mainstream media coverage is quite limited by that. When we had that summit protest that I talked about, we got the most insane conspiracy theory stuff. Like there was, they literally ran a headline saying we did a secret plan to gas 10,000 Dubliners. You know, it made no sense whatsoever. But you know, like they, they were the kind of the headlines you were getting. You know, um, so yeah, with with mainstream media, we've always had a bit of an uphill struggle getting anything that even vaguely resembles reasonable coverage. I was wondering about. Right, so one, I, like basically I, there's lots of stuff I didn't talk about. One of our big areas of activity over the last 10 years has been around Rossport, which was the, the Shell um, uh, uh, basically experimental gas pipeline and refinery they're constructing. That's been very intense. There's like uh, you know, dozens of people arrested, over 12 people jailed, and of all that sort of stuff. Um, with the fracking, it's actually taking, with the planning to do that, it's an area where we don't have any membership currently. Um, so our involvement around it has consisted of uh, organising meetings in Dublin, like uh, having speakers at the, the book, anarchist book fair and printing articles about it, uh, and linking up, sub, doing some linking up between the people involved around that Rossport struggle and the fracking struggle, although that's happening at multiple levels. So we've no on the ground involvement because it's, you know, yeah, it's out of our area. Uh, and also, it hasn't yet reached the stage where there's direct action protests there. I mean, when it does, we'll presumably we'll be getting involved at that point in that, in that sort of stuff. But it, I mean, at the moment, it wouldn't make sense for us to go up to hold meetings in Fermanagh because the people locally are, are well capable of doing it. There's probably, contact wise, there's probably at least 15 to 20 of our contacts doing work around that. So, the other thing we use this system for is to get information coming back in. Uh, and in particular, reaching out to people and, and saying, oh, this has just happened, you're involved, you know more about it than we do, could you write a piece for us that explains what's going on? Um, so we, we do that at favor. I mean, part of our, our Facebook strategy is basically to try and have two, three, four news items a day. Um, so that there's a constant flow of stuff and to have them across the scope of, of both our activity and possible activity. Um, so we've been publishing a certain amount of stuff around fracking and that to sort of get everybody thinking about it it's following it so they'll be more aware of it once, once it actually comes about. But uh, it's quite probable that will become quite a big issue, I'd say, in about a year. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the Rossport, that uh, struggling against Shell, I was talking about, it's, it's really coming to an end at this point. They've just finished the tunnel, it's all very annoying. Um, so, I mean, to a certain extent, they can claim they've won because they'll have finished the project, but it's the 3 billion euro over budget, which is five times the original budget and six years late. So yeah. we can sort of go, well, you know, we didn't win, but neither did you. Yeah. Um, they've also had a lot of uh, uh, design changes to it. So mm -hmm. but, uh, you're getting to the point where we can evaluate that and sort of go, <laughs> well, it's not all bad. You know, so far, everybody's been very reluctant to, to kind of acknowledge the fact that it's kind of come to an end. But yeah. sometimes will garner a lot of attention. Uh, so, so I'm just thinking, are you, you, do you realize that these are platforms that are available and hmm. are uh, open to, 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 to spread like a good work I mean, basically? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, no, I, 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 we, we post stuff to Reddit on a very regular basis. I mean, we were very involved in indie media, uh, what, the, sort of 19, what, 2000 to about 2006 or so, before it went into decline, as most indie media did around then. So I mean, our strategy towards that sort of online communication has shifted as things change. And it's been a case of look, looking at, well, what are people doing now? What actually works? Mm -hmm. You know, and the, the reason we've ended up with Facebook is not because we like Facebook, but it's because that's where everybody is, basically, and that's how you, you can reach them at the moment. So, but in lots of ways, it's quite annoying because, you know, 
resources we put into developing other things just haven't, uh, you know, basically been, have, have slowly dropped off. Uh, let, let me just and, and say that uh, it, it's not true that most of us are on Facebook. Most of us above, above 30 are on Facebook. Like the ones right above 20 are uh, like Facebook age or something like that. So, uh, and those are the people we, we reach. I wrote the article and 600 people pressed the like button. 137 pressed the like button. And that's all. Another thing is that Facebook is planning to make an app with news. And we have seen that Facebook are charging for um, getting this um, button space in the news feed. So then what? I don't, I don't feel Facebook is the future. Uh, I want to keep away from that. I want some alternatives. <laughs> You mean, you mean they don't click through to uh, they your site? Yeah, yeah. That you can see that from Google Analytics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They try and dispense an article, maybe it's 30 seconds, they don't read it through, or maybe they just press slide because, wow, it's a good headline, but yeah. they don't read it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, I think the whole Facebook is <laughs> frustrating uh, about spreading information. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, the adjustment we've made to, because we see the same thing, you know, like you write a wonderful 5,000 word article that explains something in amazing detail uh, and yeah, people don't click through and get maybe half of half of a half of a percent or so, which is why we, what, what a lot of what we've shifted to is these um, shorter, like three paragraph type things, you know, and a lot of, I mean, a lot of the point you're trying to get across, you need to get across the headline and the opening paragraph bit that people can see. Um, and it's, I mean, it, it's kind of interesting because I think like a lot of, uh, Radical left organisations, we're much more comfortable writing long pieces <laughs> than short pieces that try and get get a point across quickly. But like I mean, a lot of this, uh, what I'm talking about, is not. I, I'm, I'm not advocating it because I think it's the ideal thing. I'm advocating it because I think to a, to a large extent it's actually working for us. Um, you know, and I like the, the problems you're you're pointing out are real enough, and I'm, it could be the. Pro I mean, Facebook could evaporate like MySpace did. Who knows? Uh, they also could change the rules significantly. They could decide they're not having any anarchist pages, and then bam, we've lost what we've built up. I mean, they're, they're all, you know, perfectly possible. Um, uh, which is again is why we try and move people onto email, and you know, build up, build that up in different other ways as well. But uh, at the moment, at least for us, it's it's it is working very powerfully. So you have to go into the streets and Yeah, we do that too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to uh, not make noise. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it personal. Um, but uh, with Occupy Me, I, I got most of, of uh, my information about what's going on from like Reddit, Indigo, uh, and the smaller uh, social media sites with people reporting in real time what was happening. Pictures, and um, I think a really large part of, of the younger autonomy movement. To, to well, I, I'm not saying that there's one movement that doesn't want to, but yeah, there are on these smaller uncensored platforms, and we're kind of. <laughs> Do you find it's important? Yeah, I'm better now to use a certain phrase. Yeah, I mean, that's not our experience in terms of getting people along to events, for instance. 
I think uh, it's, I think what is true is that is that <laughs> the, the, so I, th I think actually what the case is that it's been used a lot less, and a lot of the reasons for that is that if you're 18, the odds of your parents also being on Facebook are quite high. Yeah. You know, so you're therefore more, you're more inclined to tr use new services that don't have, you know, that older age group watching what yeah, it is you and, actually and post. Also, of course. Uh, if your parents are on Facebook, the odds of you stating something that are either un uncontroversial mm -hmm. on Facebook goes down. But I mean, the question isn't uh, is Facebook any good or not? Because obviously it's some use, and mm -hmm. it probably will continue to be some use. The question is, how do you adapt? Because it will change. Um, if you're getting younger people out to meetings, is that giving you a resource where you're able to adapt? Are you getting the knowledge that you need about new platforms, mm -hmm. for example? Because uh, you know, MySpace went belly up pretty fast, <laughs> yeah. actually. So, you know, you have to sort of be prepared in a way. And why did MySpace go belly up? I don't know, do you know the answer? <laughs> yeah, really it's yeah, it's not well now, <laughs> but, but there's a correlation between Facebook becoming the new Robin Hood. Mm. Well, of course, uh, and, it is and, and a and that competitor that's comes along that is mm. just for various specific reasons more attractive, right? And this is happening. Have you thought about how to adapt? I suppose is the question. I, I think our experience has been we have, like, we've adapted probably five or six times in relation mm. to what we're doing in terms of online stuff pretty completely. With Facebook has been the main thing at the moment, with Twitter as our, our second um, reserve. It, we, we ha we've experimented with Tumblr and a range of other things. But actually, the, the problem with all that social media stuff is there's so many of them mm. that you can't really, you know, effectively be effective on everything so it is a question of looking at it and saying in any moment what appears to work the best maybe what appears to be working second best uh, and, and concentrating on those and then being ready to shift if things shift again uh, and I, I like i think it's a, it, it's the other reason for it also making sure that you keep trying to move some of those people the most interested people from facebook or from twitter or whatever else onto email or phone contact or you know, best of all, personal contact. Um, you know, that it's not, you know, so the, the, get, the, the goal isn't building an enormous Facebook page because maybe Tuesday morning the rules change and that, that becomes nothing. Uh, but, it, you know, identifying, okay, at the moment, what way can you reach lots of people? Um, you know, and it's not, like, it's not, not that you're reaching lots of activists and, and you know, you're just reaching lots of people who might be interested in this and might react to it. Um, and then from that sort of level, what, what are the best ways for them communicating with the people that are most interested in, in, in those ways? You know, how can you communi communicate with quite a lot of people and try and motivate them to actually get organized on things? Yeah, because that is the aim, to get more activists, yeah. to get more organized, which is the primary aim of the more radicalized communication in general. Or to organize. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's, that's the... Like, I, I, there's a relationship between those things, because if there's more people active, then they can reach more people in turn. They, they have more knowledge between them, more, more direct experience. They can report on what's happening a lot better. Uh, you know, they're going to be more convincing. Um, and if the, you know, as the population becomes more radicalized, then more things are possible on, on that side. This audio is a recording of the talk, Revolutionary Organization in the Digital Age. This talk was given during a speaking tour of Norway in June 2014, and in it, the author Andrew Flood looks at the experience of resisting the crisis in Ireland and what it has to teach us about revolutionary politics in the new digital networked age. You'll find more audio at www.wsm.ie.